Take it away, Sarah. Okay, set to recording here. All right, so um, thank you all for coming. My name is Sarah, as, as described. Um, and I should warn you all that um, I am I am at home and there are three cats and they may um, decide that they're gonna be very playful while I talk. They have a tendency to do that, but the alternate is listening a kid get ready for bed. So, um, so please forgive if cats are interrupting me all the time. Um, so, so as Matthew said in the introduction, um, I've been working on this grant at the Mac Lab um, studying horse related artifacts and I'm going to present the essentially the results of a lot of that research about uh, several years of research kind of compacted into um, an hour or less of presentation. And I got into all of this research. I've been working at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory at Jeff Pat, and I remember some people in your organization have come down and toured before. So I'm wondering if maybe I have seen some of you um, and given a tour. Um, the Mac Lab is the primary archaeological repository for collections generated by law-driven archaeology in the state of Maryland. So if a highway is going in or a school or something like that, federal or state dollars are going into that, they usually have to do some kind of review, make sure they're not impacting archaeological sites. And most of those collections come to us. Um, so I take care of collections as one of their collection staff. Um, but I also like to do research on them, and it just so happens that I have an affinity for the metal artifacts and identifying them by tiny little pieces. Um, and the more I got into that, the more I realized that really a lot of the metal artifacts we're finding archaeologically in Maryland are related to horses. And they're not necessarily getting recognized because archaeologists don't necessarily um, have the kinds of salaries that lend themselves to a whole lot of horseback riding as a hobby. <laughs> Um, and so there isn't necessarily a lot of exposure to equestrian culture in archaeology. So I got into helping describe these artifacts. Um, we have this website that's very popular for archaeologists called Diagnostic Artifacts in Maryland. Um, it, it's outdated in terms of its software right now. So it's sort of frozen. It's, it's, um, uh, we're, we're working on a redesign that would be a database driven site instead of um, the current sort of static version of the site, but it's still really popular because it gives a lot of scholarly authoritative information for identifying artifacts. And I've already added a number of small finds to this site, um, including bridle bosses for horses, spurs, stirrups, and leather ornaments. Um, and with the help of this grant, I'm gonna be adding several more categories as you will see. Um, so a lot of the source material that I've been using for this particular um, research is art. A lot of it is primary documents from the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and of course, the artifacts themselves. And by the way, um, I don't think you mentioned this at the beginning, but feel free to put any questions in the chat as we go. Um, and I will sort of keep a little bit of an eye on it in case there's an easy way to answer a question as I'm as I'm talking as I go. Um, so yeah, so one of the things I think is hardest with identifying these artifacts is one, they're not in, in the context of the, the organic materials that they're attached to, saddles and bridles uh, rot. They're made of leather, wood, things like that. And so the metal parts get all dispersed um, and so I try to use a lot of artwork to, uh, to pull those all back together. Um, and as part of this grant, the goal, these are the categories that are already on the website, the leather ornaments, the bosses for curb bits, stirrups and spurs. We're gonna add a bunch more of those. And um, I went to uh, four offsite locations to sort of flesh out our data. So at the math lab, uh, our collections start around 1637 is the earliest, but we don't have a whole lot of materials that are that early. Uh, so I went to historic St. Mary City to try to get a little bit earlier from Maryland. And then I also went to Jamestown Colonial Williamsburg and the Virginia Department of Historic Resources to round out the Colonial Chesapeake because this grant was specifically to look at Colonial Chesapeake collections. Um, and in order to do that, I have to put 
everything that we're looking at in the context, not just of Maryland and Virginia in the 17th century, but also England, because that is, Ella, sorry, the cat. Um, <laughs> because that is where the colonists and the people are, are coming from. And so a lot of the background research I did during the pandemic for this project was looking at England and what was happening with their equestrian culture at the time. Um, and then looking at Maryland and Virginia, seeing how that applied here, and then putting it all together to look at the material culture. So in England in the 17th century, when Maryland and Virginia were being founded, um, the main uses of horses were travel and exercise, so saddle horses, warfare, hunting, um, which is basically chasing down game um, on horseback, uh, often accompanied by hounds, and racing. Um, there were also uses, so that's the primary uses of saddle horses. They were also in England at the time using a lot of horses for drawing vehicles. So in archaeology terminology, uh, we have a tendency to use the word harness. This is a harness buckle, this is harness hardware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the equestrian world, harness is specifically referring to harnessing horses to a vehicle, a cart, a wagon, a coach, a plow, something like that. Um, so it doesn't actually apply to saddle horses, and that's the vast majority of what we find. So but digging into a lot of this terminology some too. Uh, so in England at the time, they're using it a lot for plowing, agriculture, carting, draft, et cetera. Um, and in England in the 17th century, horse ownership is really pretty pricey. So you know, don't only have the price of the horse, but also and also the horse tack and the saddle, the harness, et cetera, but also feed um, because the climate wasn't such that you, the animals just had enough fodder to live on their own year round. Um, there wasn't as much land to go around as there was in the colonies eventually. Um, and so there were a lot of horses kept on commons or in com community stables. And that meant that there was a lot of need for farrier services because farriers not only shod the horses for stony soils and roadways, but also um, they saw to the health of the horse. It was sort of like a horse veterinarian and, and horseshoer in one. Um, and they often needed that because communicable diseases would pass from horse to horse a lot in England in these community settings. Um, and you needed stables and pastures and, and things like that in England because the climate required all of that. So it was really quite pricey. So you had nobility and the wealthiest classes could have all kinds of horses and they would be specialized for different things, whether it was riding, hunting, racing, drawing carriages, coaches, doing agricultural work, et cetera. And you might have a whole uh, bunch of servants who were seeing to the needs of all of those different horses, whether they're horse training or, uh, you know, specifically a coachman or a groom, um, all different kinds of things that they were seeing to. And the landed middle classes and well-to-do trades people might have a separate saddle horse and workhorse and maybe one or two stable servants, but, um, but they certainly didn't have as many. Um, lower classes might have one horse that they sort of was a horse of all trades and they used it for everything. And then of course, most people didn't have any horses at all. When horses came to, to the colonies um, with the English colonies, um, there were not any horses already in Maryland and Virginia from previous colonial ventures like the Spanish. The Spanish did bring horses with their conquistadors, um, but as far as we can tell, although there's some genetic research out of acetique saying that there might be a connection, um, you know, there was no documentation of any horses being in this region at the time when, when it was being colonized by the English. Um, they, they stayed west of the Mississippi, so they did sort of spread out west of the Mississippi, um, but when England was establishing Jamestown in Virginia and St. Mary City in Maryland, there were no horses to be had here. They had to import them themselves. And the Spanish tradition was really very different. It was very much influenced by the various crusades that had happened, the Moorish invasions, things like that. So the Spanish horse tech has a very North African bent, a lot of geom geometric stuff, a lot of decoration. Um, 
And that is what evolved into Western saddle traditions. Um, those horses all ended up staying west of the Mississippi, Spanish colonies, Mexico, Texas, California, all of those areas had that Spanish influence that evolved into the Western tradition. The English tradition of saddlery stayed English. They really stayed very separate. And it really wasn't until the 19th century industrial period where you could get both, even though both traditions stayed very separated and very you know always very different in flavor and that's how those two originated but oh, i'm so sorry all right so getting horses to the new world um was no easy feat you had to ship them on tall ships um and horses have to stay standing for their health they can't just lay down for the whole trip so they often were in these slings because though their hoofs would slip on the wood you can see them in a sling here with a trough they took up a lot of space you had to head all the feed because you're talking about weeks at sea um so it really was not a very easy thing to do um in virginia horses were really rare um before 1650. Um, and in Maryland, when the first horses arrived in Maryland um, that were documented, they belonged to Leonard Calvert. So he was the first governor, you know, one of the Calvert family, one of the founding families in Maryland. His, his horses, three stone horses, three mares, one stone colt, were worth 8,400 pounds of tobacco. That was more, like, more than twice as much as his house and townland. And even more than his three manors at, at Piney Neck, which is like a lot of acreage. Um, so he was really the only one who had horses. It was 34% of his estate. People were fighting over them after he died um, and because there just weren't horses to be had. Andrew White sort of complained when he came over, oh, we can get cows from Virginia, but there's no horses to be had. So... Um, what had happened is in 1607 in Jamestown, um, they didn't originally bring horses in, in 07. They did have some shipped over in 09, but then they had the starving time. And so they ate them. And um, they had a few more shipped over um, in, the, in the following decade. But then in 1622, there was another um, conflict with the American Indians. They had to stay in their fort. They were starving again. Um, and they ate the horses again. And so the population just really needed to be imported and didn't have any time to sort of build up on its own. So you, in Maryland and Virginia, even though Virginia had this kind of head start on colonization in terms of the horse populations, um, they didn't really have that many more than Maryland did. They didn't have as much of a head start. All right, so uh, once they once people did get over here and get established, though, what they what established them was tobacco. They figured out pretty early on that this was the thing that was going to be their cash crop, um, and that really dictated a lot of the settlement patterns that that were to follow. Uh, and what they would do is um, in the 17th century, you know, by the 1650s. Um, there still were conflicts with various American Indians that were being pushed out of the area, but for the most part, they had figured out how to secure their colonies. Um, and they had a very strong foothold and they had a very established settlement pattern. So what they would do is they would get a, a big plot of land, you know, hundreds of acres, generally speaking, they had put a third of it in crops, a third of it leaving it in the woods, and the rest would be some kind of meadow for, for livestock to feed. And um, the way that tobacco was grown is that they would take these forested areas and girdle the trees and, um, and clear them that way, but they would just leave the stumps. They weren't clearing those out of the land. So they were hand hoeing the tobacco around stumps um, and this just was not conducive to using a plow. So there was no need to have horses for plowing early on in the colonies. It didn't come until later generations once the land had been cleared for, for quite a while. Um, the environment in the Chesapeake was 
was very different than what they were used to in England. Um, as we all know, those of us who live here, um, it is impossible to keep the weeds beaten back. Um, the, the foliage just grows like crazy here. And so what people would do in, in both in their woods and in their meadows is they would just let the livestock roam free uh, and they would forage. And there was plenty for them to forage on. And so all of the, a lot of the accounts, a lot of the early court cases in the 17th century have to do with livestock roaming and eating each other's crops or getting lost or somebody claimed this cow and it had this mark on its ear and whatever. And it's because all of their animals were just wandering around all the time. Um, so you would go into these forested areas amidst plantations and there would be pigs, cows, horses, et cetera. Um, to the point that, um, people would have to like walk miles into the woods to find their horse if they wanted to ride somewhere. But at the same time, the horses pretty much fended for themselves. Um, the, also the climate was so lovely here by comparison to England that they didn't really have to stable their horses except for really bad weather. And they, everybody pretty much had a tobacco house or various outbuildings where they could sort of temporarily house their horses. Um, but for the most part, livestock just kind of hung out outside and that was fine. Um, the other awesome thing about the environment, which is why I'm showing this sort of swampy picture um, for horses in Maryland, is that we have pretty soft clay soils, especially in the tidewater areas, and people weren't living all the way in western Maryland where it's much more rocky uh, early on, and that meant they didn't have to shoe their horses over here. They would just do some sort of, you know, kind of like cutting your nails, some basic hoof maintenance, but you didn't have to have a farrier. Um, and because the horses weren't crowded into stables and um, communal pastures, they weren't catching diseases as quickly either. Also, because they were roaming free in the woods, they had a tendency to do what horses do, and they all of a sudden started reproducing. So between 1650 and 1670, there was this huge boom. You go from laws banning exportation of horses from the region to laws about fence heights and how you have to have a fence a certain height so that your neighbor's horse can't eat your corn. So they would fence in their crops and then let the animals roam. And if you didn't maintain your fence and the neighbor's horse ate your corn, you couldn't sue them because it was your fault for not maintaining your fence, that kind of thing. So you end up with a situation where it is so much cheaper to own a horse in the colonies so that everybody on these sporadic plantations didn't have to worry about the expense of owning a horse. Um, and as you can see on this map, especially the one in the top right, the plantations are all dispersed so that if you wanted to have a social life and you wanted to go visit your neighbor, it wasn't so easy to do that unless, unless you had a horse to ride to the neighbor's house. Um, the old growth forests were pretty easy to go through, but there weren't any like main roadways or anything. Um, <clears throat> people did travel by water, but by, by the time you get to the 1670s, 1680s, pretty much everybody has a saddle horse and that's how they're visiting and socializing. So they're going on these like old deer paths and old growth trails through the woods to the neighbor's houses. Oh, Bella. That's my cat. <laughs> um, and, and, and that is how they, they maintained their, their social lives. So by the time you get to the end of the 17th century, all the travelers accounts talk about um, how every planter has a horse. They always ride them at a gallop. They never go anywhere without a horse. And it's really weird to see people on foot at all. Like people just weren't walking anywhere. And you also see some really great accounts um, at the turn of the century around 1701 of American Indians making fun of Europeans saying, oh, well, they can't walk anywhere on two legs if they can walk on six. You know, they're, they're lazy, basically, and they're making fun of them. Um, we also had a, a lot of background of enslaved people riding on horseback in this region. One of the big questions I had was trying to adjust sort of, okay, we're getting all these horses and saddle, um, bridles and saddles imported. Um, how does that relate to the population and who is using them? 
Um, and there really is a lot of documentation. If you're traveling on horseback and you have an enslaved population um, on your plantation who is your attendant, your groom, um, the person who's carrying your baggage, et cetera, and you're always going at a gallop, well, then you're always bringing those servants with you on horseback because they can't keep up on foot. So, um, so both uh, white and enslaved populations would have been riding on horseback. Uh, oh, and I already mentioned this part, um, indigenous people did not. Um, and this was actually one of the ways that people managed to secure uh, the colonies. Um, and it, it is a little depressing to read about some of the indigenous people talking about how they're, they're getting pushed out. A lot of the livestock really were what we're doing it. The livestock were changing the landscape, the way that they were foraging. Um, and that meant that the American Indians in the regions couldn't live and forage the same way they had before. Um, and that was a lot of what pushed them out. And for the European point of view, they, they bragged about how, oh, none of the None of the Indians around here ride on horseback. So if any of them come, you know, and make mischief, we can just chase them down on our horses and, and take care of it. So it was one of the things that helped secure the colony. All right. So the history that all that background history tells us that saddle horses were really widely used. They were affordable and not much effort was put into horse care at all. So we're going to switch and look at the artifacts now, and we have to do a little bit more historical background um, to kind of understand the artifact side of things, like where were they made, how did they arrive in the colonies, how were the goods distributed, etc. Um, and then, of course, archaeologists' favorite questions, which are, oh, what does this say about status and signaling, and you know, what did consumer choice have to do with it, that kind of thing. Um, so what my research has shown over the years is that um, saddles and bridles are really, they're, they're like a piece of furniture. So you see them referred to in the colonial documents as horse furniture, and it really is. It's like a chair. It has a wooden base. It is upholstered. Um, it is often custom fit to, made a, to fit a particular horse. There are different styles, they change through time. Um, and so they're very much a composite object. And so the way they were made in this time period is that the metal parts were made by specialists called Loriners. Um, so all of this metal horse hardware that we see is not being made by blacksmiths. That's kind of an impression I think people have is that, oh, well, blacksmiths made all of the iron stuff. And it's not really true. Iron was much more complex. There are various things made out of wrought iron by local blacksmiths, but there were also ironmongers and cutlers and loriners and all these specialists who, yes, they they did wrought iron work, but then they did a lot of very specialized, very meticulous filing down of the metal to make intricate shapes. And, um, and it was very much a specialized field. Um, the wooden base of the tree was often made by a joiner or a specialized carpenter. There was some people, their whole career was saddle tree maker. Um, and then the cloth and the upholstery is contributed by other specialists, leather tanners. Anyway, so it, the idea that a saddler made a saddle is true, but they really just dealt with assembly. They didn't actually make all of the pieces parts. Um, and then the blacksmiths and the farriers would make the horseshoes, but that's a completely separate field um, from the other people making the other horse hardware. So the Worshipful Company of Loriners um, is, is one of the main guilds of London. And you can see here are some images from the medieval period and from France of, of them kind of doing their work. It really was a very delicate, specialized thing. Loriner is a term that didn't even really make it to the colonies, didn't make it to the US. And that's because it was completely dominated um, in Europe and in England. They maintained all of that manufacturing of those metal parts over there and it didn't really transfer to the colonies. So you didn't get manufacture of these kinds of things in the US 
until into the 19th century when there was like the rapid industrialization that happened here. And by then it was all industrial production. So you didn't have sort of the craft guild terms coming in. Um, in Maryland and Virginia, they're importing complete saddles and bridles, as we'll see in a minute. Um, whereas other regions like Pennsylvania, where there was a little bit more of a trade mentality and more people like doing things themselves, um, you had saddlers who were working here, but they're still importing the curb bits, the iron, the stirrups, etc. Um, and I did a, a summer fellowship at Winterthur where they had all of these documents, and it's just a fantastic resource where you could see who's shipping what, where, um, especially into Pennsylvania. So even in areas where the assembly was happening in the colonies, the metal is being imported. And that's what we find as archeologists. So I looked at customs records um, from England um, at Winterthur and basically made note of all of the bridal saddles, chariots, coaches, harness, collars, et cetera, everything I could find in the customs records from 1697 to 1774, when England and, and America kind of went their separate ways, um, I looked at every 10-year interval and made a list of all of these mentions of things. And you would get the occasional vehicle. Um, you would get an occasional like collars for horses, which are for uh, to go around the horse for pulling plows and draft horses and things. Um, but for the most part, you would get bridles and saddles. So in Maryland and Virginia, we're importing saddles and bridles like by the thousands every year compared to New England, the Carolinas, Georgia, New York, Pennsylvania. It, it barely compares. Um, you do some of the other um, plantation, southern plantation colonies do start to bump up their imports as well as they get more established. Um, but really it's Maryland and Virginia that are kind of feeding the market. So English made saddles and bridles are, are getting exported here by the thousands by the time you get to 1700. Um, and apparently it was so weird to see a locally made saddle that um, if you saw a new, there was this great newspaper ad for uh, a stolen horse saying, oh, it has a Virginia made saddle and it's a light color as if you would recognize it if it wasn't an imported saddle. Um, and you also see sort of indirect evidence that everything's being imported because while well, in England, if you're getting a new saddle, you would generally go to the people who are making the saddles and they could take measurements on the horse. There's all these great uh, sources on how that took place. Um, to make sure that it would fit. But if you're just buying them off the boat, they're not necessarily gonna fit your horse correctly and you're gonna get saddle sores. And so a lot of the strayed or stolen horses or found horses, you see descriptions in the newspaper where they're using all the saddle sores as a way of identifying them. Uh, cause it was really common cause they're using these ill-fitting imported saddles. Sorry. So uh, one thing I think that does surprise people is just how fancy the saddles were that were being imported. Some, um, I have this great list of, of bill of lading for this one trader to the region from this roughly 1697 to 1701, um, several ships. I have the whole uh, bill of lading for the ship. And at the beginning it says, where the London merchant went. You know, I went to Elias Green for this kind of saddle and John Price for this other kind of saddle. So um, in this one ship, the Jeffreys in 1698, the London merchant went to John Price for saddles and he got a dozen saddles for five pounds. And then he went to this other guy, Elias Green, and he got velvet saddles, basically, plush saddles trimmed with silver and furniture, et cetera. And those were worth you know, a lot more than the ones that he was getting from the other saddler. And when it says trimmed with silver, 
it literally means silver. Um, we do find archaeologically metallic threads, which are basically silk threads wrapped in these minuscule microscopic silver ribbons um, used for embroidery at the time. It's used both on clothing, gloves, accessories, purses, saddles, etc. And those were over here. So you would see see the fringe on this red saddle that you see here. That is made of silver. Some of it was made of copper alloy, um, but we do know that those existed here because we know that they were imported. So you could get very fancy stuff. Uh, lots of different variety of saddles came over. And of course, this was one of the things that archaeologists love to look at because, you know, a plush saddle trimmed with silver would have been way more valuable than one of the plain leather ones that's being imported by the dozens. Unfortunately, what, what I have found in the collections and in the historical documents is that the main difference in price is to do with the upholstery, the fabric and the embroidery, and not so much to do with the metal. And that's what we find. So the metal on all of the different kinds of saddles is pretty much the same. And so we can't necessarily use it to differentiate uh, social status. So let's dig a little bit into um, the anatomy here and talk a little bit about the artifacts and, uh, and connect those to everything that we've seen in the background research. So the, the saddle itself has a tree as a base and then it's covered with canvas and various adhesives and whatnot. Um, and it has iron um, reinforcements because they're made of beech wood and it's supposed to be fairly flexible uh, for comfort purposes and it's fairly narrow. And so they would reinforce it with these iron pieces called gullets. Uh, and I spent a fair amount of the pandemic translating 18th century French documents to get really interesting descriptions of how all of this worked. But it was super helpful because you just don't see pictures of saddle gullets because you these are the these two pictures that you see in this um, slide are pretty much the only two period pieces I could find of saddle gullets. And yet we find these archaeologically all the time because normally you see whole saddles. Um, even when they survive in museums, unless you had an x-ray, you wouldn't necessarily see these. But they're really helpful artifacts for A, knowing that you have a saddle at your site. Also, you can tell the thickness of the saddle um, by the width of the rivets, or if there's two pieces, how they go together. Um, these often get described by archaeologists as architectural hardware or UID hardware. They often don't get conserved. Um, so this is one of those artifacts that's really sort of been missing in interpretive uh, interpretations of sites because it's not necessarily getting identified. So I'm trying to change that. Um, you can even tell if it's a side saddle by the shape of the gullet sometimes. Um, this nearly whole side saddle gullet that you see on, on one side of the slide is from Colonial Williamsburg and it's just a fantastic example. Um, it's one of those things excavated in the 30s when they were just digging stuff like crazy and I can't believe it survived. Um, and then there's another side saddle from our collections at the Mac Lab over on the other side, sort of showing how they reinforce the seat area. Other pieces of saddles that we find are, are civets, which are, it's, it's like a buckle. It always gets cataloged as a buckle, but it has an iron band that goes through the frame and attaches it to the arm of the saddle tree. Um, and then that is where the straps would be attached for attaching the, uh, the girth. The girth strap is the one that goes onto the belly of the horse to hold the saddle on. So the civets are a saddle. Yes, Bill. She's my biggest fan. Um, this is showing how the civets are pretty much hidden. Once you get the, the saddle tree covered, the iron band doesn't really show anymore under the canvas, but you can see the frames. And then once it's all padded, it, you can only really see the little strips that hang out from the civets. Um, that figure B is showing the underneath of a saddle where the strips are sort of sticking out on the sides. 
another saddle part that we find a lot archaeologically that don't we don't necessarily identify is the stirrup bar. Um, this is a an L-shaped piece of metal that is round in cross section at the center, but flattens out at, at each end. And this attaches the arm of the saddle tree to the front that goes over the withers and of the horse. And this is how you would hang your stirrup leathers from the saddle uh, for resting your feet on. And this is another one of those pieces of hardware that people just have not been identifying. And we occasionally find a pommel, a, a copper alloy pommel from a saddle. Um, this is a really interesting artifact because these had gone out of style. I found this amazing reference from the 1730s saying, you know, uh, we really only use these on training saddles that really have high front and back um, battens now because people were sort of falling on them and injuring themselves. So we sort of stopped using these. So we gave what we call in archaeology terms a TPQ, a nice terminus postquem for be like, okay, by 1730, these were only on training saddles. Um, so it can help us figure out who is training horses, which is really fun. Um, this is showing sort of the different types of saddles and it gives you that image from that source I was talking about. So the Cello Royale is kind of the sedan. It's your luxury sedan. It's comfy. You can hang all of your belongings off of it and all the little staples that hang off of it for your pistols. Um, this it, it is a carryover from the medieval period when there was a lot of jousting and needing to stay in the saddle and kind of being surrounded by the upholstery of it. Uh, the cell a pique is the one that I was talking about with the training saddle that still had the pommel. And then in the 17th century is when you get what is now known as an English saddle. Um, originally it started as a hunting saddle as people started jumping more for hunting. Um, you needed to be able to lean forward and have more range of motion. Um, one of the things that happened socially in the 17th and 18th century in England was that people hunting went from being kind of a, a pursuit through the woods after stags to um, fox hunting and things like that. And part of that was because of the landscape. There was deforestation and enclosure acts. Um, where people went from running through the trees where you don't want to get knocked out of your saddle to jumping over ditches and jumping over bushes and jumping over creeks and things like that in your pursuits. And that's why the hunting saddle came to be. And then the cell Ross in this picture is sort of your, I want to go to the English saddle, but I'm not quite ready to give up like carrying all my stuff with me. So that's kind of like an in-between. One of the artifacts we can use to identify when we have an English saddle is the English saddle nail. It looks just like a button. It often gets cataloged as a button, but instead of having a shank on the back, it like a loop for sewing onto clothes, it has a little rectangular hole for a nail shaft, an iron nail shaft instead. And this would have four of these would have appeared on each English saddle, one at each quarter. Um, for sort of helping um, attach that upholstery to the tree underneath and decorate it a little bit. Um, we find these a lot archeologically. And then one of the things that we find most often just sort of randomly um, <laughs> out in the landscape, not necessarily in the context of other horse related stuff or domestic goods, which makes a lot of sense because if you're picturing you're out and about, you're traveling, you're getting on and off your horse, your clothing is going to knock these and I think that they they ended up being abandoned probably because they just kept falling off like crazy they weren't super reliable. We also find a lot of stirrups archaeologically and I gotta say in Maryland and Virginia you really only kind of get two kinds. Um, there are a few outliers but for the most part we either get swiveled and barred which is what you see on the top which are ones that turn um, and have kind of an open platform, or you just get plain ones like you see on the bottom. Um, and this is clearly whatever the English were shipping over to Maryland and Virginia in, in huge quantities. This is an exception. This one is from the, there's a huge plantation called Addison near what is now National Harbor. And this particular set of stirrups was found there that was just 
remarkable and for the longest time I didn't even know it was a stirrup even though I was studying all this horse related stuff because um, it was just so unusual. All right, moving on to bits and bridles. We also find a lot of both two different kinds of bridles and the trade card you see here is the main, um, the very typical versions of what is being imported. So you see the English saddle at the top, in the middle of the picture is the girth or the belly band, and at the bottom is the stirrups. And then on either side, there's two different kinds of bridles, the snaffle bridle, um, where the reins attach at the cheek of the horse, essentially, um, which is pretty simple and not hugely decorative. And then you have the curb bridle, which is the one that is way more decorative. All right. Can you all hear me okay still? Yeah? Sure can. Okay. My Bluetooth is like messing with me a little bit. Um, so the snaffle bridle is fairly plain, whereas the, the curb bridle, it tends to be really fancy. It has all these little ornaments on it. Um, it has bosses on the cheeks that are made of copper alloy. And these can have um, at least 10 buckles per bridle. Um, so you, when you find a lot of buckles that are exactly the same, um that are sort of the right shape and size and they kind of match the ornaments um you know that you're looking at bridal buckles as opposed to personal adornment buckles for belts and things like that um here we're seeing lots of some of the curb bits that we find in maryland so curb bits are extremely complex um, instead of the reins attaching at the cheek where you pull on those reins for a snaffle bridle it makes the horse's head pull up. For a curb bridle, the reins hang below the horse's mouth. Um, and when you pull on them, what the curb bit does is it, is it creates a lever that there's a chain passing under the chin of the horse and there's a mouthpiece in the horse's mouth. And so when you pull on the reins, it creates a lever that sort of creates a pressure between that chain under the chin and the mouthpiece in the horse's mouth. And when that happens, it makes the horse want to move its head down. And so they have two very different actions. And the curb bit just is what was dominant in terms of style at the time. Although for practical riding purposes and lots of equestrian pursuits, lots of people really just use a snaffle and prefer a snaffle. A lot of it really depended on the, um, the personality of the horse. Um, but stylistically speaking, this is what everybody was using. So this is what people typically had, whether they really needed a curb bridle or not. Um, one of the really cool things about the curb bridles is the bosses that appear on the side. And these are already on our website. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, the fancy ones must mean that they had more money and the plain ones are cheaper, right? And so you can look at status. But what I found in my research was that the fancy ones are older and the plain ones are newer. So it's actually a temporal distinction. So the older they are, the more likely they are to be fancy. And it's just following like decorative arts kind of styles. Um, so what we see in archaeology, we call this seriation, seriation dating. We're looking at the different contexts and I'm comparing um, the, the dates of the ceramics to the dates of the small finds to get it at how they date. And it, it turns out that, that it's just telling time. So having a fancier boss is just what everybody had in the pre-1720 time period. Um, and then of course, not surprisingly, um, all of those little ornaments that go on those curb bridles correspond to the fancier um, bosses. So in the earlier time periods, those leather ornaments tend to be open work. They tend to have a lot of molding. Roses and arrows are really popular. And then as you evolve into much more plain styles, you get more plain um, and streamlined shaped leather ornaments that maybe have some interesting shapes, but they don't have any decorative molding anymore. And what this is, is it's really just following sort of the um, the the styles that are dominant in terms of decorative arts so you go from the baroque period to the william and mary style to the queen anne style 
is kind of an evolution from much more detailed and elaborate kinds of things to more plain and streamlined kinds of styles. And I think that part of it too, um, that my research has, has made me realize is that in the early 17th century, mid 17th century, um, what your horse is wearing is an indicator of your status. Um, but that is all kind of in the time period where breeding and thoroughbred racing and this whole concept of breeding, whether it's horses and having horse bloodlines or hounds or people and their class distinctions um, was this huge obsession in England in the 17th and especially the 18th century all the way into the 19th century. And so as people get more obsessed with breeding and bloodlines, they care a lot less about how you're decorating the horse and they just wanna show off the physique of the horse and the natural lines of the horse. So you get a much plainer style coming in. All right, so mixed blessing for archeologists because we're telling time instead of looking at status. But one of the really cool things about um, what my research has shown is that you know, here we're seeing two different sites, one in Virginia and one in Maryland. They have almost the exact same artifacts. Um, and so you can use these um, different shapes to help tell time and to help tell which uh, areas are being occupied at the same time. And it also is telling us a lot about what is being produced in England and what is being uh, sort of shoved into the colonial market. All right, we have a couple examples. I think we're around, we're getting to be around an hour and I wanna do question. Um, but just real quick at, at the Mac Lab, we are at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum and um, we have a really unique setting where our 500 acres has three different sites all associated with the same family. So there's a father and then his son's first plantation and then his son's second plantation after he made some money and he moved to location. So King's Reach house was his first house, 1689 to 1711. Then he moved to the Smith St. Leonard site and built a brick house. And the horse related stuff at these two sites is just fascinating. Um, and so I'll, I'm going to end on this slide just to show the, the connections and how cool it is. We know that the Smiths were really doing a lot of horse related stuff, probably horse training and breeding and racing um, because they had a stable, which is really rare. As I, as I mentioned earlier, most people didn't really need a stable. Um, but at, at the King's Reach site in the 1980s, they found three bridal bosses that you see um, down in the bottom corner. And one of those had this great fleur de lis open work design. Well, we think that the King's Reach site, after Richard Smith built his new brick house, he moved over there and they probably used that as a quarter for some of their enslaved population. Whoops. And when they did that, there was still a connection. So, so there's whoever lived at that quarter also had horses um, and would probably use those horses to travel back to the main plantation from time to time so they could be in communication. And so just two or three years ago at Smith St. Leonard, they were doing public archeology span and they found the matching um, open work fleur de lis cheek boss at the other site that, that dates later. And so it really shows the connection of those two sites. And um, it's just a very cool find um, that talks about how horses were being used on this landscape. All right, I'm going to stop there. I didn't see. Uh, that was awesome, Sarah. There's a question in the chat. Do you see it? I do. Yeah, I think I'm afraid the slideshow is going to do, do the automatic thing. Yeah. Oh, so I say copper alloy. Um, uh, OK, so yeah. So the difference between copper alloy and iron on this stuff, copper alloy, I say, because um, they would have called it brass. All of these little, all of the little pieces, the ornaments, the cheek bosses, all that, they would have called it brass. Um, it, bronze is more like stuff that you, you do like bigger cast 
statues and things like that. Um, iron is definitely used for strength, but it's not as, it wasn't necessarily as expensive and it, and it corroded more easily. And so they would use a lot of the little copper alloys for the decorative parts, <clears throat> but not the parts that are going in the horse's mouth or that you're gonna stand on like for your stirrup and stuff, unless you had a really fancy one. So the copper alloy is your more expensive stirrup, your more expensive um, consumer goods, but they're, they're using that even on the everyday saddle just for decoration. Um, see, somebody wants to know about King's Reach. Um, that is, there's a, there's actually a big interpretive thing. So it's at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. When you drive in, there's one of the parking lots is at the King's Reach site and there's a little um, sort of interpretive area and deck that you can walk on and see the outline of, of those buildings. And then we have those collections at the Mac Lab. Sorry. Anything else? I know you guys are an archaeology club, and I so I was like free with my TPQ language and whatnot. And you guys probably all speak that. Maybe I don't have to explain what seriation is. I don't know. I think you you were kind enough to explain the terms as you went along. So okay. that was very helpful. I appreciated that. Mm, good. I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Any other all questions, right. folks? All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Yes, yes, Daisy, I, I'm recording it. I'm going to upload it to YouTube um, probably by the end of the week, and I can notify you by email when I do that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Bel Air. Um, I had a friend, Samantha Dorsey, who used to work at, at Bel Air, and I know that they have the stable and everything. Bel Air is much more, um, it's later 18th century, so you're getting into sort of like the early federal period, and I'm very much like strictly the colonial period. So by then you had much more use of horses for pulling vehicles and plows and they actually had roadways and things like that. They would actually shoe their horses by then. So um, that's sort of post-colonial, um, but yeah. So just just be aware if you're gonna use that at Bel Air that, that a lot of the stuff that I said about, oh, they just let their horses roam in the woods and they didn't have to shoe them, that doesn't apply at Bel Air. Right. Now, do you, are you still in touch with Sam? Oh, yeah. Oh, I said hello. <laughs> I have an antiquing date coming up in August. I'm so excited. Tell her, tell her I said hello. Okay, we will do. Yes, uh, somebody's like, oh, this is like horse country heritage. Yeah, so a lot of, um, how I'm couching this research is uh, people talk about colonial or they talk about Chesapeake horse culture, that, that Maryland and Virginia are sort of like horse obsessed. And this is really how it started. And I didn't mention this much in my talk, but what happened is when everybody was riding their horses to visit each other, they also rode their horses to go to church and to go to court every time the courts met once a month, et cetera. Um, and you sort of had to have your horse as like a status thing. And because of that, all of these races would pop up. So by the 1670s, 1680s, the races, like everybody expected them. It was part of the entertainment and, and a lot of people were engaging in that. And so racing and gambling and everything became very much tied up in it. And then everybody was participating. Um, it, you could only do betting and, and running your horse if you could afford to cover a bet. So there were sort of class limits and distinctions there but in terms of who the spectators were it was everybody including the enslaved population um and there's some really great quotes about how um sometimes when the these races were brutal like they they were dirty they were like trying to knock each other off their horses there was like no rules uh, some of them were violent people got hurt um and and everybody cheered so <laughs> It wasn't it wasn't on the level of jousting like the like the question here, but it it had that kind of competitive violent element to it. Um, I don't know. I don't think they were doing jousting in the colonial setting. I've never seen any any references to it. But yeah. <laughs>
And if you want, I see, you know, somebody's going to share this with Pony Camp. If, if you want to reach out to me or anything here, I can enter in the chat my email. Um, I have a handout that sort of is just a little summary for archaeologists of the material culture involved, um, which is probably more than a Pony Camp would really necessarily care to have, but the, but the history part is probably a little I can better. share that with, with everyone who's registered, if you don't mind sending that to me, Sarah. Sure. The, yeah. um, the handout? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just email it to me. me later. I'll pass it on through uh, yeah. our website to everybody here. I'll make a note. Thanks. How many did we end up getting? Uh, my at, outreach numbers. At the top, we had 22. A couple people, I think, That's left, and then a couple other people came. So you know, around around 20 throughout the hour. Are there resources for ad info like history and heritage? Oh, additional info. Um. Yeah. I, I haven't connected so much. Um, I intend to, I need to finish this grant by October, which means I need to get the artifacts online. And so I'm very focused on the archeology span and the artifacts right now. But what I would like to do after that is to reach out to like the, um, the horse industry board. And there's like a, there's a division department of agriculture that, that deals with the horse industry. And they, that might be the same thing. And um, and, and other organizations like that to see if they have an interest in this level of history. You know, a lot of the people I've met who are into horses, they want to ride horses today. Um, and, um, they tend to look at the, the historic artifacts as, oh man, I can't believe they did that to the horses back then, or, oh, some things haven't changed or, you know, and, and that's a bent that I really, I'm not tuned into because I don't ride myself and pretty much everything I know about this stuff I learned from period documents, um, kind of by design. So once I get all of that sort of written up, then I'm going to be hopefully much more open to contaminating my brain with more modern material by reaching out to people who do this now and see how things have changed. Anyway. Oh yeah, so Maryland Horse Board. Yeah, okay. So I did kind of have that right, yeah. Because there is fellow state agency. I'm kind of like, you know, uh, there's a, somebody's getting a new building. It's like a library, an equestrian center library, something in Northern Maryland. And part of me wanted to be like, ooh, I should offer to do them an exhibit. And then I was you like, totally what am I doing? I need to finish my grant you first. You need to do more things. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, but I, I do hope to do that at some point. And, and also I think we sort of hope to have, there's, there's so many horse farms and, and, and barns and things around Jeff Pat specifically that we've never really reached out to those folks either that, that we need to do, but, and you know, we all have our silos. So anyway, all right. That was so interesting and I could tell people were into it. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. All right, well, I will make a note to email you that handout. Um, and yeah, so mm -hmm. and if anybody has any other questions, they can always follow up with the, with the email I put in the chat. All right, great, thanks. See you All next right. time, everybody. Thanks Appreciate for coming. It.